Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views with multiple uploads every week to help share the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of D&D. Today I want to, uh, I want you to imagine a trip, a dark trip to the Shadowfell. We know that the Shadowfell is a very dangerous, energy sapping, gloomy and dismal place, a nightmare reflection of the prime material plane with its own rules and threats. Some parts are relatively safe for mortal creatures to exist, but there are many places where the sorrow, hopelessness and despair are so overwhelming that it becomes very hazardous for mortal life to exist there, without being warped and drained by the plane itself. In these dark areas, the border between the Shadowfell and the Prime Material Plane is much farther apart. It requires magical ritual and divine or infernal power to draw these realms together. However, while the world of the living is far away, the realm of the departed is much, much closer, and quite often, they actually overlap and merge. From these breaches in the border of the ethereal plane, the tormented dead, most desperate to return to the world of life, can actually step through. There are a few who have witnessed this happening in person, such events taking place far from where the living interlopers in the Shadowfells typically lurk and scuttle, clinging to their tenuous points of light in the darkness. Some may stray or foolishly venture into the deep and desolate waste, where the undead prowl and hunger eternally for the fitful spark of life and warmth. The living, chased by the tireless, hate-filled undead, may head for safety in a direction that undead seem less inclined to populate, where they see less roaming horrors who turn, into, uh, turn to give them chase. Eventually, the gloom closes around them, the air becomes rare and difficult to breathe, the cold seeps into their bones, the tormented aura of the place sucks any hope of survival from the mind, and then... When they are at the very brink of death, something crawls inside, pushing their soul out into the ethereal plane to continue its journey to whatever fate it has awaiting it. In the Shadowfell, the body is warped and twisted. Raw emotion is all that animates it. The spirit that has possessed this flesh has long ago lost all memory of itself as it once was. It now exists as nothing more than an endless state of madness. It is a sorrow swarm. It is true that this is just one of the ways the Sorrow Sworn come into being. The Shadowfell is a realm of nightmare where the rules of reality often take a back seat. There are some Sorrow Sworn who somehow find the strength to rage and break out of the ethereal realm and spontaneously manifest physically in the Shadowfell, their flesh and bone forming out of wretched ectoplasm, oozing and frothing out of tears in the transitive plane of the dead. This is by no means a common occurrence. They are, uh, there are divine forces actively at work to stop this occurring, and only the imperfect existence of the Shadowfell even makes this sort of breach possible, though there are some twisted layers of the abyss where similar conditions exist and Sorosorn can be encountered there as well. Much like the demons themselves, the Sorosorn manifest from a state of utter torment. They have had everything torn away from them, lost all sense of self. The only thing that sustains them at all is an extreme in emotion. And this, thus, this is what defines them and separates them into distinct types. They are at home in the Shadowfell, but this was no way what they had intended, uh, where they've intended to wind up. They want to return to the land of the living, not this dead and barren place. So they're drawn into any perceived chance that they can detect to get away from the Shadowfell. And this invariably leads them into deadly conflict with the living. Oh, I should point out, talking of demons, there is a sorrow sworn demon. It's not the same thing, and I'll be talking about them at a later date in the collection of videos I call the Demon Series. If you're on the Shadowfell and your character sees a gaunt humanoid some 12 to 15 feet tall with hooked claws grasping a wicked glaive, dusky hide, wide tooth more, twisted horns and an expression of mocking grief on its face and thin bat-like wings, yeah, that's a demon and you should keep at least a... Oh, a hundred feet away from it at all times. I'll probably show um, up. The, they'll probably show up just after one of the party members has died, um, as they're attracted to those suffering from loss and sorrow. The Shadowfell and cities afflicted by uh, plague and famine are rich pickings for these demons. Otherwise, they will lurk near hospitals for the wounded, orphanages for those left without parents, and homes of bereft people. And, and at mass graves, of course. The Sorosorn are beings of incarnate emotion. As it says in their listing in Morden Canaan's Tome of Foes, they, their nature provides a clue to both understanding how they become more powerful and to how to overcome them. Giving in to the negative emotion that the Sorosorn represents causes these entities to grow deadlier. Fighting against these emotions can weaken them and drive them away. First, before talking about the specific examples of their kind, a note on encountering these desperate and evil entities in other forms. Sorosorn are one possible manifestation they take when they take corporeal form in the Shadowfell, but 
When a necromantic spell breathes undead life into a skeleton or creates a zombie in the prime material plane, the magic nabs one of these beings from the border ethereal and funnels it into the corpse, or of course from the negative material plane that directly. Sometimes they can manifest in places where a bridge forms that resonates with their particular emotional focus. So in places where great outpourings of frustration and anger may trigger the arrival of a poltergeist, which has similar properties to a ghost but it's all telekinetic mayhem and really becomes visibly manifested um, in, in a physical form like it does in the form of the Sorosorn anger. One could say that when a cleric turns these undead it's like a blast of emotional force that the Sorosorn entity simply cannot stand to be near but the nitty gritty of how turning undead works is really up to you and the player of the cleric character. Wretched Sorosorn are the least powerful but they're still quite dangerous thanks to their habit of swarming around in mobs and attacking in overwhelming numbers. Like all the Sorosorn they have 60 foot dark vision and most importantly any bludgeoning, piercing and slashing damage is halved when they're in, uh, uh, while they're in any sort of dim light or darkness which is quite common in the Shadowfell. Even magical weapon and spell attacks that cause these physical damage types are much less effective when these creatures are in gloom or in shadows. So it's half damage even with magical, magical effects. So the Sorosorn, all of them, will seek to snuff out light. Like all Sorosorn, they understand the common language but the wretched cannot speak it or any language of their own. Their mouth is simply a grotesque lamprey maw full of rows of fangs. They attack by charging in, their normal speed is 40 feet per round, but they can dash into melee when they latch onto the target with that bite. Striking with plus 3 to hit, doing 1d10 plus 1 damage as the fangs and their hooked claws latch onto the flesh, automatically inflicting a further 1d10 plus 1 points of necrotic damage each round unless they are torn off which requires a character to spend one of their actions grabbing and removing them like some sort of snarling, snapping piranha turkeys. Thankfully, they only have a strength of seven, and they're quite stupid creatures. Though not entirely mindless, they are so savage and direct in their method of attack that they're very easy to predict and defend against, unless they're attacking together. Alone, they have disadvantage on all attack rolls, but when within five feet of another Sorosorn or an ally, they gain attack uh, advantage on all attacks every time. They are tough, for small creatures with an armor class of 15 and an average of 10 hit points. They don't really need to feed on flesh that they bite out of their victims or the blood that gushes from the shredded wounds. It's actually the panic and fear that the wretched gain their sustenance from, as well as the actual life forces of the victim, which they seem to greedily suck out with their horrific bite. As a strategy, it may pay to throw a few wretched into the most uh, most encounters with Sorosorn. After a few run-ins with the smaller packs of them, players will be likely to avoid areas where large numbers of them are milling around. It may be fun to throw these creatures into unexpected locations, such as altering an encounter dramatically as a swarm of them arrive and tear the, character uh, the character's former foe to pieces right in front of them, then springing wildly at the player characters who are likely to wonder what the hell's just going on. Other Sorosworn may follow along with the pack of the wretched, using them like bloodhounds and shock trooper minions, waiting for the wretched to latch onto the otherwise and otherwise occupy and distract the targets before the more deadly Sorosworn moves in for the kill. The most likely candidate for that sort of attack is either the hungry or the lonely Sorosworn, but I'll talk about the lost um, Sorosworn first because they're next up the pecking order of toughness from the deceptively one quarter challenge rating wretched. The lost are fear and desperation in Incarnate. They kind of remind me of Alips and Bodak. Perhaps that is what a soul destined for that sort of fate looks like if it manifests in the Shadowfell. Who knows? Anyway, they have. Uh, they also have an armor class of 15 and an average of 78 hit points and a speed of 30 feet per round. Aside from impaired mental attributes, they're physically the match for most player characters of mid-level. If you send a group of them at characters lower than level 5, some of the characters are going to die, probably. The Lost are notably quite strong and mobile. They use their plus 6 bonus to athletics skills to uh, grapple. And one look at these things will tell you that this is going to be a formidable tactic, as they have, on average, five arms that end in long, sword-like, hook-like, blade-style claws. The, they make two arm spike attacks on their turn and will leap, uh, tend to leap out of concealment suddenly at the start of an encounter. Is it always best to give them that chance to showcase how nasty their embrace can be? I'm a strong advocate of this as a dungeon master. I'm not interested in pointlessly long, drawn-out fights that end up 
feeling more like a math exercise. No, I want combat to last just long enough for the players to feel threatened and spend their resources and the monster to showcase what it can do and then either die satisfactorily or make a retreat, hopefully driving the players further into the plot and the excitement. The Lost's Armed Spike Attack is plus 6 to hit and does 2d10 plus 3 piercing damage, so they stab. They're very stabby. Also, the damage seems to imply they stab with more than one arm at a time. Their Embrace Attack is also plus 6 to hit, does 4d10 plus 3 piercing damage, and the target is grappled, but can attempt to escape at the start of their turn by making a Strength or Athletics roll of 14 or higher. That's what the DC 14 means. If it is a medium or smaller creature, so the loss will avoid grappling large creatures. It's simply not effective. But since it can attack with its regular arm spike stabs even while grappling a victim, thanks to having all those multiple arms, they will always try to grab someone and have somebody grabbed. Until the grapple ends, the victim is supernaturally frightened and it takes 66 psychic damage at the end of each of its turns. I mean, how frightened do you have to be to take 60? Eight, sorry, 68, 6d8, eight, six eight-sided dice psychic damage at the end of each of its turns. Thankfully, the loss can embrace only one creature at a time. However, there is a nice twist on this attack that really is what makes the Sorosorn justifiably renowned for. Called Tightening Embrace, if the Lost takes damage while it has a creature grappled, that creature takes an additional 4d8 psychic damage. This is not cumulative, thankfully, but even as little as one toy point of damage will trigger the psychic torment. This effect is not just a combat statistic. As the Dungeon Master, it's your job to represent what a creature of supernatural emotional force is really like to be in the presence of. This is a close proximity psychic assault, So, but the characters should be able to feel it very noticeably within 30 feet of the Sorosorn and keenly when they're within melee range. If you've done your narrative work well, and the player of the fighter is describing how their character is screaming uncontrollably as they desperately fight this thing off, when all they want to do is run away and go home, give that player an inspiration point because they've got it. The Shadowfell is as much about the feel of the environment as it is about the stark and harsh obstacles to survival there. The characters will start to feel like there is no way that they're getting out of the Shadowfell intact and sane, that the place is sucking the very life from them and twisting them into darkness and insanity. Encountering a Sorosorn is like a confirmation of the character's darkest, most irrational fears, and it should be deeply disturbing. It's like, oh god, I'm going to turn into one of these things unless I get out of here. The Lost are drawn to sounds of warmth and light. They are one of the reasons it's unwise to try and light a campfire or carry a lantern or even cast a light cantrip within the wastes of the Shadowfell. They can also speak common, and if you listen to the keening of the wind of the gloom, you can hear the whimpering cries and occasional terrified screams of the Lost as they wander the darkness. The Lonely are next up the pecking order, per se. Warden Kanan's guide says that the sorrow of isolation afflicts many creatures that lurk in the Shadowfell, but the need for companionship is never manifested more dramatically than in the Lonely. When these Sorosorns spot other creatures, they feel keenly the need for interaction, and so they launch their harpoon-like arms to drag the victims close. You can resist saying, get over here when they harpoon someone like Scorpion from Mortal Kombat, but you'd be a better person than I. I always tend to do that. The lonely can sense those who feel isolated, not physically, but mentally, and will attack those creatures, individuals in a group that feel the most alienated from their companions. They prefer to sneak up in the cover of complete darkness and attack within 30 feet. They are not very smart, like all the Sorosorn, but have a set method of attack and they tend to repeat it if every time. Kind of instinctual. While the Lost are challenge rating 7, the Lonely are challenge rating 9 and quite formidable. They are perfect to drive a mid-level party through the Shadowfell as a relentless boss monster that's chasing them down and attempting to pick them off one by one. They see a group of companions and they hate that they have com comfort and friendship and it does not. So they are driven to take a friend for their own. With an armor class of 16 and an average of 112 hit points, speed of 30 feet, and a brutish strength and constitution, they know that they can't stand a toe-to-toe -to -toe fight with a whole party of adventurers, so they snatch and kill um, the victims instead. They make two attacks per round, one with their harpoon arm and one with their sorrowful embrace. The harpoon arm is plus seven to hit 
and actually has a range of 60 feet, which is grotesque to witness as the thing is um, their actual body. They don't draw in some extra dimensional matter to extend the arm that far. They fling the spike forward with all their force and it tears a grisly trail of bone, sinew, twisted muscle and skin like a shredded, corded and gore glistening rope, which they then flex and haul back into their body. This is clearly agonizingly painful, but they do it again and again and again. Physical pain is nothing compared to the tormenting emotional nightmare that drives them. This emotional turmoil is so strong that each creature within five feet of it must succeed on a DC 15 wisdom saving throw or take 3d6 psychic damage at the start of each of the lonely's turns. When it is within 30 feet of at least two other creatures, it has advantage on all its attack rolls. Otherwise, it has disadvantage on all the attack rolls. So really, the best thing to do is stay away from them. This is what happens in combat, though. The party will seek to stay out of the 30-foot range of, um, and attack the lonely from further out, but the thing keeps flinging out that arm and dragging victims towards it, where they're left to try and escape from its grapple, uh, its grapple by themselves. The harpoon arm is plus 7 to hit and inflicts 48 plus 3 piercing damage and the victim is grappled with an escape roll over 15 required to break free. Even large creatures can be harpooned this way. Also, the lonely has two harpoon arms and can uh, grapple up to two creatures at once or impale the single target with both of its arm spikes, making it harder to escape. Once a creature is grappled this way, the lonely inflicts its psychic damage. Unless the victim makes a DC 15 wisdom saving throw, they take 48 psychic damage, or half of that if they do make the saving throw. The victim can be the assault, uh, hit with this assault even if they've not been hauled 30 feet closer to the lonely by its retracting arm yet. Um, though it will usually try to do so, even though the smart thing to do will be to keep, keep the victim outside of its melee range of itself um, and just inflict the psychic damage from a distance. But they're driven to haul them close and actually embrace them. But they're smart enough to dash away from the rest of the group to kill the victim pri privately. Worst hug ever. Now, we have the hungry. <laughs> These predators are often found in the company of a swarm of the wretched. The tome says that the hungry do whatever is necessary to sate their appetites. These greedy devourers consume all life and energy they encounter, stuffing their maws with flesh and drinking in the victim's screams. When they're finished, they lurch away with their eyes bright, resuming the search for something else to consume. Challenge rating 11, so a threat even to a high-level party, one of the things that mid-level parties will need to run for their lives from if they detect one is anywhere near them. Luckily, the hungry will usually only show up if the characters have failed to bring enough provisions or can't seem to make a roll, to, roll a survival check to save their lives. Also, I don't know why, but I, I don't like good berries and rings of sustenance as a dungeon master, unless it's a cursed ring of hungry, hungerlessness, in which case the character starts to starve to death but never feels any less than uh, totally full and sated. Anyway, when the characters start to feel hungry, it's like a beacon or flare goes off that the hungry Sorosorn can sense from miles away. Hunger is their blood in the water and they can prowl the desolation like restless sharks constantly hungry themselves and, and um, keenly aware of any other creatures that are hungry around them. The hungry tends to show up for the first time when the characters are at the low end um, or at the end of their tether when overdue for a long rest. A party that has engaged in a number of scraps with swarms of wretched, some whites and ghouls, skeletons and shadow sturges, they'll be hunting around for some safe spot to rest, eat and recuper recuperate. And that is when the hunger comes charging at them. A ferocious, direct and brutal attack with absolutely no quarter asked or given. With an armor class of 17 and an average of 225 hit points, speed of 30, but always charging into combat with a dash, the Hungry is a melee engine of death, mainly because it's life hunger ability. When it's within sight of any creature that regains hit points, within sight of any creature that regains hit points, it becomes so, so much worse, suddenly doing an additional 4d10 necrotic damage with all of its melee attacks and striking with advantage on all of them until the end of its turn. So the players will quickly figure out as you describe how this thing just hulks out whenever the tired and damaged party members try to spend hit dice or get healing magical potions into them, that this thing is going to tear them apart even harder if they do so. So it's not something players tend to deal with on, in combat normally, and it feels a lot like the rug just got pulled out from under their feet. 
now they're on an even footing with this monster and it is a desperate fight just to survive really um, the smart players may discover that if they, they can heal if they do so out of sight of the monster. And it is your job as the dungeon master to describe that the hungry Cyrus Swan will be looking out right at whoever is healing themselves the moment before it hulks out and rages out again. They can uh, put two and two together and players that do tend to uh, tend to do so or they they may have some familiarity with the Cyrus Swan as players and maybe waiting for you to describe this behavior and then ask if their character can figure it out, in which case it's a matter of a wisdom check to see if the character has noticed this correlation. It is perfectly reasonable for a player to do so. It would be metagaming only if the character acted on the player's knowledge before the character even saw the creature do this in the encounter. If the player does that, then I suggest letting the monster forego the need to see the healing taking place, and instead have any healing within 120, of it, 120 feet of it be all the trigger that it needs to hulk out. Watch that metagaming player have a hissy fit when you throw that spanner at them. And if they and if you explain carefully to the other the other players just what happened, peer pressure will do more to nip that metagaming behavior in the bud than any reprimand you could give. Nice one, Kevin. Now we're all going to die. <laughs> just give them an added objective in that case, such as an amulet of Sorosworn, uh, that the Sorosworn is wearing on a chain about its neck that glows a moment before the eyes do, just as the character is healed and the hulking out occurs. The players will figure out that if they manage to snatch the amulet away, that uh, they will be able to heal out of sight safely again. Without um, And you just watch how motivated Kevin becomes to get that amulet. Adapt your counters on, encounters on the fly to keep the players engaged. The Hungry makes one attack with its claws and two bite attacks each round, which is quite unusual compared to most other monsters. So it's, it is bitey, very, very bitey. Bitey. It's uh, plus eight to hit with all melee attacks. The claw attack has a reach of 10 feet, even though the Hungry is just a medium-sized humanoid. The claws do 46 plus 4 slashing damage and are webbed to scoop out chunks of flesh and blood. It makes sense when you see how they consume the internal organs of a victim, like they're power eating a tub of gummy worms and jello, like they are bailing water out of a leaking boat right into the moor in a fountain and spraying of blood. Too much? Maybe. If the creature uh, clawed is medium or smaller, they're grappled. The escape DC is 16, and while grappled, the ferocious strength of 19 of the hungry will restrain the victim, which leaves them free to bite and bite and bite, otherwise known as feeding. While restraining a meal, they can't claw anyone else, but they have two bite attacks, so they can bite the victim and bite anyone else who comes too close to them. The bite attack inflicts 1d8 plus 4 piercing damage, plus a further 3d8 necrotic damage, as they're eating the life force out of the victim as much as they're ripping chunks out of the body and swallowing it. The hungry will kill victims. It will also linger over its meal until it's eaten the entire body. So dropping to zero hit points anywhere near the hungry is a very bad idea. These monsters should earn a particular reputation for killing at least one player character whenever they're encountered, much like Chul. Given that, giving, it gives them some sort of a, um, a reputation. Also, I would suggest giving them a paralysis gaze when going up against a very high level characters as these monsters uh, they, they should be in the hall of fame of character killers when um, when you think about it. Last on our list of the Sorosorn is the Angry, a challenge rating 13 monstrosity. The tome says that they rely on violence to sustain their existence. The Angry grow more powerful when their foes fight back. If a creature opts not to attack though, the Angry becomes confused and, it atta and its attacks weaken. Each of the Angry has two heads, which bicker with each other until they find something else on which to vent their wrath. So a bit like a Nightmare Etten or the idiot, idiot babies of Demogorgon. As with all creatures with two heads, the Angry have an advantage on perception checks on, and uh, on saving throws against being blinded, charmed, deafened, frightened, stunned or knocked unconscious. It has an armor class of 18 and an average of 255 hit points. When I say an average of such and such number of hit points, it means that that's the statistical medium result of its actual hit points of uh, 30 D8 plus 120 hit points. So the maximum hit points of the Angry is actually 360. 
you are free to give a monster maximum hit points if you want to as a dungeon master, particularly as the angry is intended to be a formidable melee combat brute. Having two heads also boosts the angry's passive perception to 16, so they're harder to sneak up on, but still not that difficult for the sort of player character roles um, that high enough level, uh, well, when the characters are high enough level to take on something like this, um, they're going to have formidable stealth checks anyway. By mid-level, most stealth-based characters are damn near invisible anyway. So put a, I don't know, a huge number of tiny shrieker fungus in the encounter area to spice it up a bit. They may even be the friends of the angry. Uh, it enjoys crushing them one by one and making them squeal. So if the player characters start uh, turn up and start crushing them, that may be all the motivation it needs to attack them. The angry makes two melee attacks each round. They have hooks for hands and are plus eight to hit. They do not have reach like the hungry does, but do 2d12 plus three piercing damage. The formidable thing about the angry though is their rising anger ability. If another creature deals damage to the angry, the angry's attack rolls have advantage until the end of its next turn. And the first time it hits with a hook attack on its next turn, the attack's target takes an extra 3d12 um, psychic damage. So the first hook attack it makes. On its turn, the angry has disadvantage on attack rolls if no other creature has dealt damage to it since the end of its last turn. They are um, still pretty dim-witted, but with an intelligence of eight, intelligence of eight and wisdom of thirteen, they're still smart enough to know that they can force other creatures to try and attack them by threatening to kill other creatures and destroy property, which they do all the time. Also, I should point out that if they are with a swarm of wretched, the wretched may actually attack and damage the angry as well. And all it needs is a little bit of damage every round to keep up that advantage on its attack rolls and that extra wicked three d twelve psychic damage on the first hook attack. Um, it's quite reasonable to do that, even though the players may call foul. Um, it's that's that's the entire point. It's it's just got to keep getting damaged each round, and it and it stays angry. They are angry anger incarnate. They need no other motivation to rampage and murder. It's all they exist for, and they never ever calm down. You could say that not attacking and damaging them simply means you are less of a focus of the anger that forms the core of their being. So they'll just move off on the next target one after the other. No doubt there are many other forms of Sorosorn. They are an interesting assortment of monstrosities, quite fitting to the Shadowfell, I think. A needed inclusion to help round out the environment and uh, the sort of threats that you would encounter. Like, subscribe, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos. Buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride. Check out Patreon Blades for a mighty smooth shave. And as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you all very soon.